This is Lewis Hart for Boxing Social in association with Empire Fight Store and Forged Irish Stout. Delighted to be joined with Andy Clark. We're here in not so sunny Bournemouth, very different to the last time we was here for Chris Bill and Smith, but he does defend his WBO world title against Mateusz Masternak. Um, looking forward to some, tomorrow night? Yeah, very much so, very much so. It, it, it's always good to come here. It's, um, it's great to get I was going to say it's great to get away from the major boxing centres, that, that, that sounds a bit unkind, but it's good to come somewhere where you know they don't get big time boxing all the time, um, but with Bill and Smith it's becoming more of a regular thing for, for Bournemouth fans, but it was a great atmosphere here last Christmas against Armand Jojai and that was a really, really entertaining fight, then the stadium in May was amazing, so yeah I am, I am and, and I think he's been quite bold Chris in his choice of opponent, I think Masternak is and this isn't me just talking it up, he is a genuine threat and somebody who I'm pleased to see get a world title fight because he's deserved one to be honest. He's had a couple of near misses, fights if he'd won he probably would have got one but no one in a decade of him being in top 15 has ever chosen him for a voluntary before and there's a reason for that, it's because he's dangerous. So I think the Massanac camp, I think they respect Billum Smith for for doing this, but I think they also think that he's made a foolish, foolish move. Absolutely. And one thing I just want, did want to touch on early on, you mentioned there about it is nice to get away from the major cities in a sense, but also what is nice is whilst Bill and Smith is on, on the main event and he's the main attraction, it's also nice to see the sort of the, under, the undercard and sort of get hometown talent pushed through. As we saw with Wolverhampton, lots of lots of young talent on the card um, from sort of the Midlands area. And this this week we see Lee Cutler, Louis Edmondson, um, you know, different sorts of undercard that may not get that shine living in sort of an area like Bournemouth and being from the south coast where there isn't much boxing consistently there. Yeah, and, and, that, and that's the thing. If you if in an area you manage to get a, a fighter who can headline shows like Billy Smith can, then it just brings everybody else up. You know, it's that it's that old saying, rising tide lifts all ships. And, and Lee Cutler is that kind of like biggest ship apart from Chris down here, basically. So it's great for him. Uh, he took his chance in, in May, um, boxed really well in May, I thought, to get to get that win, to set this fight up. And he's changed things behind the scenes. He's now with Josh Pritchard, um, so training at McGuigan's gym alongside Chris. But yeah, it is good. It is good because, you know, you put a few people on the undercard who you know are going to sell tickets. And you know that they're going to stick around for the rest of the show rather than come in and just watch their guy and then leave. And that just creates a really, really good atmosphere and a kind of different atmosphere because it's, it's a crowd that doesn't necessarily get to see live boxing all of the time. Um, and it does, yeah, it gives it just a bit of an extra, a bit of an extra factor. It definitely does here, you know, the, the, the big hall that we'll be in tomorrow night, it's, it's a bit like this, isn't it? Because you've got the ring at the end and then you've just got this load of tiered seating kind of just sloping down towards it. So the noise just really, just like a wave just kind of travels downhill, down towards the ring. Um, yeah, no, it's good, it is good. Seaside towns in winter are a bit odd, aren't they? Because, yeah. uh, <laughs> Yeah, the, the, no, no, it's, you know, it's good, it's good, but it's, you know, I always think of like a, a kind of rain-lashed palm tree always looks a bit bleak, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. Um, someone that will be a keen watcher tomorrow night, sitting, I'm sure he'll be sitting ringside, is um, Richard Riakpour. Uh, he very much wants the winner of this fight. Uh, he's been, been a bit frustrating, especially this year with his career. Um, do you feel like that could be the logical step next for, for the sort of, if Billy Smith gets through, they do end up doing that rematch? Yeah, because he's, he's number one with the WBO. They haven't called the mandatory yet. They haven't installed him as mandatory challenger. But from what I can tell, we do expect that to happen. Um, and were it to happen, it would happen soon. I think pretty soon after the result comes in tomorrow night. So if William Smith could get the win, then Reactor, it looks likely, would be next. If they don't call that mandatory, then it'll be a Coley. But if they do, then it'll be Reactor. And, I think it's a fight that people are keen on because the first one, I commentated on the first one and it was it was close. I mean, Chris always disputes a knockdown. I felt like it was a knockdown. I thought the ropes kept him up. I thought that was fair, but it was really, really tight, really tight. And it didn't do him any harm at all losing that fight. It was in that string of fights that Richard won, which most of the time he felt that he probably wouldn't. You know, Sam Hyde, Tommy McCarthy, that one, Jack Massey, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So yeah, I think we all we all want to see that. And as far as I know, um, yeah, React Hall will be there tomorrow. And is it a bit crazy to think that not not crazy in a sense because it was a close fight, but React Paul beat Bill Smith 
and now he's the one chasing Billum Smith and Billum Smith took, obviously took that loss and he's rebuilt himself to, to be a world champion before Riyadpur uh, sort of had a shot at a world title as well. It's just the way things can, can go sometimes, isn't it? It's, it's that, you know, the boxing's odd, isn't it? You have to drive your own career and circumstances can work against you sometimes. And after you've won that British title against Jack Massey, you had a long period out of the ring, Richard. And it kind of reignited when he signed with Boxer and Sky about 18 months later. So in that time, I don't think he boxed at all, did he? So that, you know, that's a problem. Whereas Billum Smith has managed to remain active and throughout that period, um, he picked up the European title, the, the British title. He, he was winning titles and remaining in the kind of public consciousness. So those are the difficult periods that you have to work through sometimes. And, and, and he, I know that the, I think they'd done the artwork actually for the fight against Arsene Gulamiri, and that seemed like it was it was ready to go. And then that didn't happen. So it's been frustrating for him. Absolutely, we saw him at the start of the year. Um, and then we saw him a few weeks ago, uh, and he did what he needed to do against against Brejean, um, which was good to see. But he will just be desperate to to get installed as mandatory after tomorrow night. Whoever wins that fight and get his get his chance. Definitely. Well, we'll move on to topics uh, on the day of day of reckoning is about two weeks away. In, uh, two weeks away now. Um, some news came out this morning that the IBF were not willing to sanction. Were not willing. They were not willing to let Eli, uh, Jaya Pattaya fight Elis Zorro. If they do do that, they said they were going to strip Jaya Pattaya. Um, with this news coming out two weeks before, uh, is this a bit sort of surprising to hear? And what do you think Pattaya should do from now on? It's a difficult situation for him. I, I'd imagine he won't really appreciate the fact that they've decided to do this now because that fight was announced, what, two and a half weeks ago? Or was it two weeks ago? At least two weeks ago. At yeah, least. yeah, not, yeah, exactly, not far at all. Like, about sort of six six weeks till the fight that's when it got announced weren't they, they could have done it then couldn't they they could have told him then listen this isn't this won't we're not going to have this because now you know this is this is not really fair on anyone this is it because Ellis Oro is expecting to fight J.R. Pitar in what could be a life-changing fight for him obviously if he wins but I think in terms of the money he'll make from it it'll be pretty life-changing for him too so he'll be on tenterhooks waiting to see what Pitar is going to do I don't know the kind of purses that Opatai has commanded in his career so far, but, but what I am confident of is that what he's due to get paid in Saudi will be significantly more than anything he's made previously. Does he really want to pass up on that? Vacating your world title is a, is a big, big decision, but anything, anything can happen. You know, you could pick up an injury. You know, if the money's there, then... I kind of feel like you've probably got to take it, but but it's a really difficult one for him. It's really, really difficult because once he does have a title, you're relying then, if you're him, on one of the champions wanting the kudos of, of, of beating you. Um, and they might not fancy it because, you know, he's, he's very good. I was going to say that, like, with you mentioning it there, do you feel like Opatai might look at his as a thing as, like, the rumours are that he's getting a seven-figure payday for this. He said, I get paid, I vacate my title, and, you know, because I am sort of, everyone talks to me about me, me being the num rumoured number one cruiserweight, someone's going to want to give me a voluntary. Do you feel like sort of he could have looked at it in that way? But just take the payday and then sort of look at potentially going down another route for a world title? Yeah, I, I think he's, I, that's why it's a hard decision, because let, 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 let's just say that he is, let's say he's getting paid a million. Um... I would guess that might be four or five times more than he's been paid for a fight before. That's a guess. I'm, 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 honestly, I'm not great at guessing purses. I'm, re I'm really not. But that would be my guess. Um, I mean, that's a massive difference. That's a massive difference. It, it, you'd, you'd imagine that it's probably more than he's made in his career in total up until this point. So that's a huge consideration because... that. That is what they're in it for, you know, this is prize fighting, they, they, that's what they're doing in there. Deontay Wilder said that at the press conference, didn't he? Um, and it's really interesting what he said, and, and he's right, you know, you do it to look after your families, you entertain the fans, but you do it to look after your families. So it's, that's why it's such a difficult decision. But once he hasn't got a belt, then people can try and avoid him. Although it might not take too long before one of the other sanctioning bodies before he's right up towards the top of one of the other sanctioning bodies. But it's a tricky one. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky one. And like I say, I do have sympathy for him because if the IBF were going to do this, they could have done it before now. Absolutely. Um, moving on, 
Deontay Wilder came out in an interview and he talked about sort of AJ uh, Hearn and AJ's team sort of were never interested, they never interested in wanting AJ to fight uh, himself in Deontay Wilder. Um, and many of the, the, the people around, along the years have said, you know, with the fight not being happening, it's on AJ's side that AJ's team always have sort of pushed away the idea of Deontay Wilder. Um, with Wilder coming out and saying this, um, what do you make of those comments from Wilder and sort of that sort of whole sort of narrative that gets painted that AJ's team want to push AJ away from Wilder? Well, I think, I think the first thing with something like that is that I don't... Like, it's not AJ. It's, it's not Joshua. Let, let's just be clear about that. Because they're not scared of each other, these, these, these guys. They're not. You know, they... I, I don't believe they are anyway. I think they'd all fight each other happily. Um, sometimes business gets in the way. Sometimes you might be advised not to go that route. Not quite now, because something else might happen and, and you can maybe get talked out of it. But it's not... It's not... It will definitely not have been the case, I don't think, that a fighter would turn around and say, I don't want to fight him, basically because I think he will beat me. I, I just don't believe that. Um, but there are other reasons that can, that can make things difficult. It's impossible to know what really happens now. We, we, we feel like we know what happens because a lot of it's played out on social media. But really, all we're seeing there is what they're happy for us to see. So it doesn't really mean we're any the wiser than we were before when you just found out about a fight when you know the sports desk could get a telephone call and you'd all pile down to a press conference so he does generally tend to to get the blame for it Joshua but I, I, I mean I don't know how valid that is and, and it doesn't matter now anyway because that was then and this is now and if those two win on the 23rd then the pressure for that fight to get made will be will be big but what tends to solve most problems is money uh, that's how they all ended up sitting on those three or four tables when we went to the press conference with Eddie next to Frank Warren practically. It's money. Um, yeah, that, that's, that solves all problems, doesn't it, generally? Definitely. And with you talking about uh, the potential of Joshua Wilder, do you feel like we could get to that stage or do you feel like maybe December 23rd there could be a, a, a script ripped up, maybe a Wallen win or a Parker win or things like that? Do you feel like there is, there's a real possibility of that? Yeah, I think, they are, I think they are losable fights for those two. Um, they're correctly favourites, but Wallin is, is a good fighter. Um, he's proven that in a number of his performances. And being a southpaw, he, he, he's tricky. He's going to need to be on point, Joshua, to make sure he takes care of him. Uh, and the same thing for Wilder, because Parker, I think, is... I feel like he is improving with Andy, with, with Andy Lee. Um, Wilder can be outboxed, we've, we've, we've seen that. No one can do it for 12 rounds. Well, Fury did it for, for 12 rounds in their first fight, but then the second and third stylistically were, were different. He, he chose to you know, stand with him, which generally speaking is not a good idea. It hasn't been for anybody else. He's the only one who's managed to do that, and I don't think they'll be looking to do that. But at the same time, they're not going to look to run for 12 rounds either. That's not, that's not their style. But, but that's the one that I find most interesting. Wilder against Parker, I think. Not necessarily because I feel like Parker's got a better chance of beating Wilder than Wallen has got of beating Joshua. Just, just, just the all-round kind of appeal so of it. The whole, the whole card, that's what you find most yeah, interesting? I think so, yeah. I think Wilder-Parker is the one I like most. What about DeWar Miller? Another interesting fight, do you think? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, that's, 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 yeah, no, that's, that, that's, that's an entertaining fight, definitely, isn't it? You think, anyway, because Dubois, need, I mean, he badly needs to win there. He badly needs to win. And I know they feel like Miller's ideal for them because, you know, you don't have to go looking for Jarrell Miller. He's a big, big target. Um, but, you know, Miller was a typical form of the press conference. You know, despite the... It's strange because despite the... You know what, what a serial offender he is when it comes to PEDs. He's still just really engaging a good company. It's just it's hard not to like him. With you saying at the press conference, it does sort of bring me back to uh, Eddie Holm was speaking to seconds out, and he talked about a conversation he had with Jarrell Miller. Um, sort of Jarrell had a choice words for him to say like why don't you back me like you back Conor Ben um, he said to also said to Eddie Hearn uh, you know when he, when you're in New York I'll get someone to pull up on you I'll pull up on you Eddie's sort of response was I don't really care mate um, what did you sort of make when you heard those conversations happen then or you heard sort of it get put out that those conversations happened with Miller and uh, Hearn yeah I don't I mean I didn't really I haven't really paid too much attention to that to be honest it's just kind of he said she said um, Jarrell Miller, I, I mean, I totally believe that he, that he may well say something like that. 
I don't. I just wouldn't have thought that that would be something that that Eddie Hearn would be bothered about. Um, he's probably heard it all before, I'd imagine, from disgruntled fighters. But I mean, that is kind of yeah. That is kind of Miller's. He says lots of things, doesn't he? Basically. Definitely. And just the last one from me. Um, recently, John Fury came out and made comments about sort of the sort of a, a, a decline in Tyson Fury um, and he feels that sort of like the power is sort of a, a little bit more powerful and uh, less powerful sorry and the conditioning may have gone down a little bit slightly um, this also has been after the, the Ngannou fight a narrative that people have tried to paint that sort of there is a little bit of a decline in Tyson Fury with this leading up to the uh, Alexander Rusik uh, fight what do you sort of make of those comments and do you feel like you potentially do see a decline in Tyson Fury with all the damage that he's taken, uh, as I said, getting dropped in the Ngannou fight, the Wilder fights and across his career as well? Yeah, you, everybody declines as they get older. You know, if you're, if you're boxing clean, then everyone declines as they get older. It's just a question of how, to what extent can you slow that decline physically? You know, that, that's what happens. And it's, strangely, it's, it's good to see because if you do see it, then it makes you quite confident that they're doing things right, that they're playing by the rules. So, I mean, that, that definitely could be, that could be true because that third fight against Wilder was so hard. And since then, he's not really been extended. I don't think he trained at all for that Ungarni fight. I think that's why we saw what we saw. And that won't happen for Usyk. That won't happen for Usyk. Um, but whether he's still got enough in the tank to really find that bit extra in the heat of a really hard battle like we saw him do against Wilder getting off the floor twice in that, in that round, maybe not because that does, at some point that will go. Um, you don't know that it's gone, you only know it's gone when you go to find it and you discover it isn't there anymore. So I think that's something that all fighters kind of live in fear of a bit as they get older because they know it's coming. They, they, they know it's coming and, and he could be at that point but equally he could quite easily not be. It's just he was so bad against Ngarno and one of the reasons why he was so bad was because he didn't believe for one second that he was any kind of threat and that just means that in training you don't you don't train with that intensity. You, you can try to but you just from what people tell me you can try to but you just don't. And with that being said, with the wear and tear and the seeing the decline, do you feel like we might be seeing sort of the last couple of fights with Tyson Fury? Yeah, I mean, if it's the case that he is, that he is, and, and he can feel it himself because he'll know, then yeah, possibly, possibly. But I mean, he said not that long ago that he wants to stay in boxing for as long as he possibly can, that boxing will retire him and, and not the other way around. And that, that generally is what happens when, when you look down boxing history. Fighters do often stay a bit longer than they should because they just find it so hard to let go. And you don't like to see it necessarily, but it's really understandable because you've got to have a massive amount of self-belief to do what they do. A, a ginormous ego in, in, in the right way to just get in there in the first place. So when you lose, you're not just going to think to yourself, oh, that's it now, I can't do it anymore. You're going to come up with a reason why it happens. And then even when you lose again, you're going to think, mm, no, nah, this camp wasn't great, or this happened or that happened, or it was close on the cards and I should have got it. And you're going to come up with another reason. You, if you look at records of fighters generally, when you talk about once you maybe go on a bit too long, they usually maybe lose three of their last four. So they'll lose one, then they'll lose another one, then they'll take a bit of an easier comeback and then they'll go back in deep and lose again. And at that point they think, ah, oh, actually it's me. So they take some convincing. So I feel like he's gonna be, he's gonna be with us for a while yet, I think. Absolutely, Andy, just wanna say thank you for taking time to speak to me. Always appreciate it, catch up with you. And yeah, it's good to catch up with you again, mate. And enjoy Saudi when you go there, mate. Thank you. Cheers, mate.